Chapter 24, Setting the Stage It took Richard almost an hour to finish his dinner. The luthier had insisted that it was necessary, for the master virtuoso must learn to judge a performance regardless of the stage it is performed on. The only change in the menu was a chilled sample of their own special grape juice in a blue, hand-blown glass, which Richard enjoyed even more than the first. He found it much easier to eat when he ignored the table, and could almost enjoy chewing and swallowing if he closed his eyes and thought of something other than dog food containers. After lunch, Richard and the luthier remained at the picnic table. The luthier began. Some criticized Paganini for how he set the stage, saying that he stated the rumors for his ego. Some claimed he powdered his face and darkened his eyes to make people feel possessed so they would have to buy his expensive tickets. Some say that he had assistants play notes on an organ, slightly lower than the human ear could detect, in order to give the audience that eerie feeling that something was all around them and closing in for sensationalism. Some said he had assistants prop open heater vents and windows at just the right time to imitate depression and tingling sensations so he could capitalize on their exaggerated emotions. Are you suggesting that I do all these things? asked Richard remembering the feelings he had experienced while in the violin shop? No, you cannot reinvent the wheel. You cannot rediscover America. You cannot be the first man to step on the moon. No matter how long you practice or how hard you try, you cannot be Paganini. You must learn from the old masters, then use who you are deep inside to succeed. Find out who you are, Richard Gaspar, then use it to set the stage, and never perform until the stage is fully set. Richard knew the luthier's words were true. He remembered that day in the retirement center, before and after Michelle held up the music. He knew that he had played well, but until she held up the song and looked into his eyes, he and his music were nothing. He may be the great Richard Gaspar on the outside, but deep down inside, he knew that he was nothing. Richard left the hospital four weeks after Mrs. Becker's visit. Even though he had told the nurses that he could manage by himself, they helped him into a wheelchair and carried his personal belongings. It was cool and cloudy outside, and an autumn breeze sent a chill through his body. I think we should just go home, Elaine pleaded while helping Richard into the back seat. I never got to say goodbye, he answered after his door was closed for him. He leaned his forehead against the window and looked out. No one said another word while they drove back to their small town. As the car entered the city limits, George tried reasoning with Richard. It's all the way across town, Richard. We can take you there some other time. Maybe even later this afternoon, after you get settled in. Richard responded to his father with silence, and his parents looked at each other in despair. They knew it was hopeless and his father shook his head while turning onto the street that would take them to the cemetery. Richard watched the familiar sights pass by and looked at each sidewalk he and Michelle had walked along while searching for new adventures. He looked down each road as far as he could, knowing what was at the end of every one, and remembering what they had done there together. He gazed at the clouds in the sky and thought of all the things Michelle had said while they lay side by side on the grassy knoll. His thoughts darkened while he thought of the two months spent entirely alone after the Ferris wheel, and how his life had become so empty and worthless. 
Richard had managed to survive in the hospital because the new surroundings had not reminded him of Michelle. Now, everything he saw was theirs. Somewhere they had been, or something they had shared together, and it began tormenting him and beating him down. The car stopped at the curb, and Richard looked out across the tombstones before slowly opening his door. He had gone through a vast amount of physical therapy, but still had a long way to go. He was stiff, and everything hurt. Richard eased out of the back seat and stood up. He became dizzy and his body ached, yet he followed his parents toward the recently covered grave where Michelle was buried. Your father helped Mr. and Mrs. Ross sell the Buffalo Nickel collection so they could pay for the funeral and buy a headstone. It's the nicest one you could ever imagine, and it should be placed in another week or two, Elaine explained. Richard walked toward a small brass plaque. It had the words, Ross, Michelle, printed above some numbers and letters representing the plot location. He knelt and placed his hands on the side of the fresh mound of dirt. After looking down at the scars covering his arms, he closed his eyes. When he thought about the thorns tearing at his flesh, he realized, I would do it again if I could just see Michelle one more time. Richard opened his eyes and looked up. Why did this have to happen? He asked God, if he were really there. Is there a God? Richard questioned. If there is, why would he take Michelle? Why take her from me just when we were free? Richard began sobbing, and his parents both placed a hand on his shoulders. I am nothing without you, Michelle, he cried out loud. Nothing, he repeated while remembering the time he had spent without her. Richard hated what kind of person he was before meeting Michelle, how he thought of no one but himself, then how he thought of no one else but her. And now she's gone. There is no God, Richard screamed while shaking his fist in the air. He looked back down and started viciously digging into the side of the mound with his bare hands. George and Elaine had to physically pry Richard away and restrain him while he fought and screamed, then dragged him to the car and put him in the back seat. His father held him tightly while Elaine drove the car back to the hospital where they asked for a psychiatrist or any other kind of help they could offer. That was Richard's first night in the asylum, and it took him two years to say the words, I am ready, and walk out the door. Richard dropped his head in his hands and leaned over the top of the picnic table. Nothing had changed since the day he broke down sobbing on the floor of the violin shop. Nothing. He knew his dream of the people hanging from the ceiling was gone, but now his heart was back, and it was literally torn to shreds. Richard began shaking, and he couldn't breathe. It was then that he realized what the luthier meant when he spoke of pulling his heart from his chest and showing it to him before he died. Why must you torment me? Richard sobbed. I am here to help replied the luthier. You keep tearing me apart inside. You give me hope, then you dash it to pieces, over and over again. Richard's emotions overwhelmed him. I see you and your wife so happy together. Then you remind me that I'm alone and that I am nothing. You give me hope only to tell me that the solution is hopeless. No matter what you know or who you are, I just can't take it anymore. Richard closed his eyes, lay his head heavily on his arms, and wept. The sun was behind the mountain by the time Richard lifted his head and looked around. The large house was silent. When he stood and looked at the picnic bench covered with dog food and cat dishes, he realized that Cheryl and the luthier were right. 
everything surrounding the performance was as important as the performance itself for the performer as well as the audience. Every time he walked out on stage, it was for Michelle and to make her happy. And every time he looked out into the audience, Michelle was not there. He used to dream of finishing his finest performance, and at the end of the fifth and final encore, she would appear and give him a kiss. Then he realized, without her to inspire him before he went on stage, his music would always be hollow and devoid of feeling. He may be the great Richard Gaspar on the outside, but he was nothing inside. Nothing just like the 13-year-old boy playing the violin in the study before his music stand was knocked over. Richard walked into the living room where silence hung in the air as thick as fog. He felt so alone. He listened more carefully, just like the luthier had told him. He fervently closed his eyes and listened. Nothing was there. He had never experienced loneliness accompanied with absolute silence before. There were no cars driving by, no banging of doors, no people talking, no fans or refrigerators running. Nothing. He was truly alone. A picture of Cheryl and the luthier hung on the wall. It reminded him of his and Michelle's. He then looked toward the large front door and knew that if Michelle were to walk through that door, his life would never have a moment without music and laughter again. He actually began dreaming that it could happen. After all, this was the luthier's house. After a few minutes, Richard realized that nothing was going to happen, and he gave up hope and walked outside. As the massive front door swung open, he thought he could hear music in the distance, faint and sweet. He turned. Come sit down, Richard, Cheryl offered in a soft, soothing voice. She was sitting on a porch swing, and Richard walked toward her. Who was she? Cheryl asked with an understanding in her voice. Michelle Ross, he replied the most perfect girl in the world. After looking into Cheryl's eyes, he added, for me. What happened? Cheryl asked in such a way that Richard couldn't refuse telling her everything. When Richard had finished bearing his soul, Cheryl smiled with a comfort and understanding that soothed his fears. Just the look in her eyes gave him more hope than all the years he had spent with psychiatrists. I am truly sorry for what you've had to live through, Richard. If Sean died, I know that I could never remarry because I've known the feeling of true love. Legends talk of it. Novels write of it. Everyone hopes for it. But it's a rare gift, and once you have had it, nothing else will ever do. When I married Sean Diego... It was forever. There was no till death do us part in our ceremony. We will live and we will die happily ever after. I don't know what you think about life or God, but life isn't always fair. God allows some terrible things to happen in this life, but there is more to you than just this physical body. Cheryl placed her hand gently on top of Richard's and smiled like an angel. Somehow, God will make it up to you if you never give up.